Grace and peace to you. I don't have my microphone on. There we go. That's better. Grace and peace to you, and welcome on this 14th Sunday after the Pentecost. We continue our summer series of hearing the parables that Jesus tells us in the Gospel of Matthew. Hearing a parable today about a vineyard owner who turns his vineyard over to some interesting vintners. Uh, We begin our worship with the prelude.
You may remain seated for our confession. Today, since it's Labor Day weekend, our confession focuses specifically on our work and on workers, as well as our entrance in. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, on this Labor Day Sunday, we celebrate and honor our calling in Christ to labor for God's kingdom with our good works of compassion, grace, and justice. Yet we also confess our bondage to a labor system rife with the hardships, exploitations, and injustices of sin. Let us confess our struggle to be faithful, confronting our weakness and imploring God's forgiveness that we may be renewed in our efforts to be more God's people in every way. We confess a concern for the reward of our labors and the satisfaction of our needs and wants that too often overlooks, ignores, or intentionally closes our eyes to the peril and plight of others who work we benefit from. We have faltered in our faithfulness, O Lord. When what we buy seems too complex to have concern and compassion for all the hands that conceived, designed, mined, refined, produced, assembled, packaged, marketed, delivered, and sold the goods we consume, forgive our lack of holding ourselves even as accountable as we could be. We have have faltered faltered in in our faithfulness, O Lord. When we know that we can decide between the results of labor done with justice and equity and labor that is exploitive and oppressive, yet we make price and cost to us more important. Forgive us. We have faltered in our faithfulness, O Lord. For too often being silent supporters of a society and an economic system that rewards the labor of a few elites with astronomical compensation while allowing the many receiving minimum wage and other unsustainable salaries to suffer, forgive us. We We have have faltered faltered in in our faithfulness, O Lord. When we fail to advocate for equal pay, for equal work, for eliminating any discrimination in hiring or the workplace, for policies and regulations that protect the well-being, safety, and health of all employees, forgive us. We have faltered in our faithfulness, O Lord. And when we ourselves are disrespectful, uncourteous, and ungrateful to anyone who labors on our behalf, forgive us. We We have have faltered faltered in in our faithfulness, faithfulness, O Lord. Lord. God the Father, in a great labor of love, sent the Son, our Savior Jesus the Christ, to do the faithful work of suffering, dying, and rising, that we might know the promise and hope of forgiveness and salvation, even in the face of our shortcomings and sin. Therefore, in obedience to the command of Our Lord Jesus Christ, I declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. a treasured people of the Lord, a people holy to the Lord our God. We have seen what our God has done. We declare his faithfulness from age to age for all time. We hear and keep his word. And all that God has spoken, we will do. Let us pray. Gracious, Gracious God, God, as, as what, what is, is planted in, in the ground and bears fruit, and we, and we are, are nourished, nourished and sustained by it. So make your word planted in our hearts bear fruit within us, that we and all who seek goodness, wisdom, and compassion will find these blessings nurtured and sustained through all our words and actions. We pray this in the name of the true vine to whom we have been grafted in grace, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The first reading is from Isaiah chapter 5. 
Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it will be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it will be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It will not be pruned or hoed, and it will be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. God expected justice, but saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We say responsively, Psalm 80. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. You brought the blind out of Egypt. You drove out the nations into the land. You cleared the ground for it, and it took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out its branches to the sea and its shoots to the river. The boar from the forest ravages it, and all that move in the field feed on it. Turn again, O God, look down the heavens and see, every bar of his the stock at your right hand. The second reading is from Philippians chapter 3. Finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you over and over again is not a waste of time for me, but it makes you more certain about what I say. Keep a careful eye on the dogs. Keep a careful eye on the workers of evil. Keep a careful eye on those who want to mutilate you. For we are the ones who really are the people of God. We are worshiping the Spirit of God and boasting in Christ Jesus and do not have confidence in our birthright. But whatever I had that I thought was profitable to me regarding my righteousness, I have now come to regard as unprofitable because of Christ. I now consider all those things unprofitable because of the unsurpassed knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, through whom all things suffer loss and are considered trash. I do this so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having my own righteousness that comes from the law, but one that comes through the faith of Christ, the righteousness from God based on the faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the experiences of the stress of being faithful and even being faithful to death, like Christ was, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this resurrection or have already reached this goal, but still I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
gospel according to Matthew, the 21st chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. In the last few days before his death, Jesus was in the temple being challenged by the Jewish religious leaders. Jesus responded by telling three parables. This was the second parable. Jesus said, There was a householder who planted a vineyard, and he built a fence around it, and he dug a wine press in it, and he built a fortified watchtower over it, and he gave the vineyard over to vintners, and he traveled abroad. But when the critical time for the fruit came near, he sent his slaves out to the vintners to collect his fruit. However, the vintners collected his slaves instead. They beat one, they killed one, and they stoned one. So the householder sent other slaves, more than he did the first time. But the vintners did the same things to them, too. Later, the householder sent his son to them, saying, They will be shamed before my son. But when the vintners saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir, brilliant. If we may kill him, we may take his inheritance. And the vintners, collecting the son, threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Having finished the parable, Jesus then asked the Pharisees, the chief priests, and the elders of the people, when the Lord of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vintners? They said to him, those evil he will evilly destroy and give the vineyard over to other vintners who will hand over the grapes when the critical time of the fruit arrives. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures, the stone rejected by those building, this one has been put in as the keystone. This comes from the Lord, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing the fruits of it. And hearing this parable, the chief priests and the Pharisees realized Jesus was speaking about them. They schemed to gain control of Jesus, but were afraid of what the crowds might do if they did. For the crowds thought Jesus was a prophet. The gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, to you O Christ. I'm very excited that we have yet another baptism today here at Grace. This makes the fifth one this year and the 62nd baptism that I've done in my six years here at Grace. It's wonderful. There is hope for the future of the church if we could just get our act together, right? And I am so excited that uh, the baby's name this morning is Sophia. Because Sophia is a word that appears often in the New Testament. The New Testament being handed down to us in its oldest form in Greek, and Sophia being a Greek word which means wisdom. And wisdom is mentioned often in the New Testament. It is something that we who are the baptized are supposed to pursue and prefer and pray for. In fact, during Sophia's baptism, we will pray that the Spirit is stirred up in her, that she may have wisdom, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. So watch out, Mom and Dad. Though I realize that most parents are not concerned so much about that, but concerned that when their child is baptized, the kid may cry, right? Or make a fuss. Which I say, don't worry about, really. It happens. And if it happens, it's fine. I actually think it's wonderful because when the kid cries or makes a fuss, it reminds the rest of us who are baptized that being baptized (laughs) makes an impact on us. And sometimes that impact is not all smiles and giggles, right? So it's wonderful that we're having a baptism here today. And it's wonderful that we'll pray for Sophia to grow in wisdom. But I understand why parents are concerned about how kids behave in church. Parents don't want their children to be disruptive in church, or really disruptive anywhere that it's not appropriate. Parents don't want to be the one that's labeled as the bad parent who 
can't control their kids or who hasn't taught their kids to control themselves, right? Because being out of control is not good. We learn from the various early days of our life about how being in control is better and wiser. It's why we hope to eventually graduate from wearing diapers. It's why we follow the line leader in elementary school. It's why we don't end up yelling at our boss all the time when they're frustrating. It's why we don't spend our whole paycheck at the end of the week, but we control ourselves and defer our gratification by investing for our retirement. Along the way of life, we learn the wisdom that being in control leads to better outcomes than being out of control. Wouldn't you agree? Again, I remind you, you're Lutherans. You can nod or shake your heads if I ask a question. Yes. Yeah, so you may be interested in hearing this parable that Jesus tells us about, control. Now, I know control is not usually how this parable is understood. Sadly, for centuries, Christians have heard this as a story Jesus is telling us Christians about how bad the Jews actually are. Because it's far too easy for us Christians to hear this as a story, which is an allegory about how the Jews rejected all the prophets that God sent to them and eventually rejected even God's son and killed him. And so the Jews have no place in God's vineyard, no place in God's kingdom. It is sad that we Christians have heard this as a story that simply justifies our anti-Semitism. But, hey, we're Lutherans, and I feel good about the fact that we Lutherans have worked hard to liberate ourselves from our misguided anti-Semitism that we've had in the past, and we don't have to hear this as a parable about others, but we can hear it as we've heard every parable we've been hearing this summer, as Jesus teaching us something about ourselves and about how we should be. Though unlike the other parables we've heard this summer, this parable is, in a word, brutal, isn't it? I mean, it's not the kind of parable we Lutherans use as a Sunday school lesson for our kids. While the other parables we've heard this summer could all be rated G, <clears throat> this one could almost hardly be rated PG because of all the violence that's in it. Though the reality is, we have always turned to violence to maintain control. To maintain our control over others, to maintain control over situations. We use violence offensively, and we use violence defensively. Both of which happen in this parable. Now the story begins with a landowner a landowner who is obsessed with control and being in control. In fact, if we are one of those few Lutheran congregations that is mostly Native Americans, we would immediately understand the desire for this guy to have control over the land because he thinks he owns it. We clearly see, though, that he wants control of the land when he plants a vineyard in it. He's taking what was wild and waste and trying to bring order and make it productive. Which is not a bad thing at all, wanting to control the land in this way. As long as, as we have learned, you don't control it in a way that causes the topsoil to erode or the ground to lose all of its nutrients, and then we would have no control whatsoever over this ground. And then this vineyard owner really overtly expresses his control over this piece of land by building a fence around it and putting a watchtower in the middle of it to keep others out, making it clear, this is my vineyard. And then finally, he shows his confidence in his control over the land by digging that wine press something that's not going to be needed in a new vineyard for several years, but which shows his confidence that his control over this land will yield good grapes that will be harvested and turned into good wine. 
Clearly, this landowner is one who wants to be in control. And his control doesn't seem to be bad. It seems to be reasonable, wise even. And it seems wise and reasonable that this landowner would then turn over the vineyard to vintners, people who are experts in how to raise grapes and harvest them and turn them into good wine. That makes sense. The twist in the story, though, comes when these vintners don't do what is wise. When instead of allowing the slaves to collect the grapes off of the vines, these vintners instead collect the slaves. Why would they do that? It doesn't make any sense. Though we begin to understand why they do that when the landowner, the vineyard owner, eventually sends his son, thinking that when the son arrives, the vintners will wise up. Instead, the vintners simply show their true agenda, don't they? They make it clear that what they really want is to be in total control. They want the son dead so they can have his inheritance, which means they want the father dead too, because what they really want is to be totally in control of the vineyard. Which I understand. I mean, wouldn't that be nice? To be in total control? To have everything happen that you want to have happen? And to have it happen in the way that you want it to happen? How's that working out for you? Sometimes okay. Sometimes not so much. Now, I know you've been waiting for it, so let's just get right to it. I think that Jesus here in this parable is teaching us that we may need to experience a radical reorientation of our evaluative point of view on what it is that we are in control of and what it is we are not and who ultimately is in control. Because, look, if these vintners had understood the limits of their control and who is ultimately in control, if they had acted wisely, if they had just planted and nurtured and harvested and pressed and fermented and mixed good wine, this would not be a brutal story about violence. It would be a happy story about the wonderful success of the vineyard, which we hear is how the story is going to end. It is going to be a happy story about the wonderful success of the vineyard. Just not with those vintners. What I hear Jesus teaching us in this parable is to recognize and realize our proper place in the vineyard to understand the limits of our control and who is ultimately in control. Something that's not easy for us. That's an evaluative point of view on ourselves that's not easy for us to swallow. We who have, since the earliest days, been taught the wisdom that being in control is better. Having control is better. It's difficult for us. We want to cry out, make a fuss, rather than acknowledge and accept that there are limits on our control. It's difficult for us to really try to understand what that means for how we are to live with wisdom, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord.
seated. Uh, keep your finger in the Apostles' Creed because you'll need that in just a few minutes. But uh, come on over, everybody who would like to gather around the font with Sophia. Oh, right here is fine. Yeah, that's good. Come on in. John will move around so he can. <laughs> it's not a problem. Come on in here, D. You can get in closer. You might even get a little wet. It's all right. <laughs> Everybody see? Come on in. Brothers and sisters in Christ, in holy baptism, our gracious Heavenly Father liberates us from sin and death by joining us to the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are born children of a fallen humanity. In the waters of baptism, we are reborn children of God and inheritors of eternal life. By water and the Spirit, we are made members of the church, which is the body of Christ. As we live with him and with his people, we grow in faith, love, and obedience to the will of God. Do you present Sophia to receive the sacrament of holy baptism? If so, please say, we do. In Christian love, you have presented Sophia to receive the sacrament of holy baptism. You should therefore faithfully bring her to the services of God's house. You should teach her the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, the Ten Commandments. And as she grows in years, you should place in her hands the Holy Scripture and provide for her instruction in the Christian faith, that living in the covenant of her baptism and in communion with the church, she may lead a godly life until the day of Jesus Christ. Do you promise to fulfill these obligations? If so, please say together, we do with the help of God. We do with the help of God. And people of God, do you promise to support Sophia, to pray for her, nurture her, and empower her in her, in her new life in Christ? If so, please say together, we do with the help of God. We do with the help of God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Can you help me out here in just a minute and pour this into the font? Thanks. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood you delivered Noah and his family, and through the sea you led your people Israel from slavery into the freedom of the promised land. At the river your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit, and by the baptism of Jesus' death and resurrection, you have set us free from the power of sin and death and raised us up to live in you. The whole thing. Good job. Pour out your Holy Spirit. The Spirit of your living word, that all who are washed in the waters of baptism may be given new life. For to you be given honor and praise through Christ our Lord in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. And now I ask you to reject sin, profess your faith in Christ, <clears throat> confess the faith of the church, the faith in which we baptize. Do you renounce all the forces of evil, the devil, and all of his empty promises? If so, please say together, we do with the help of God. We do with the help of God. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. If you'll put Sophia's head over the font, like we're going to wash her hair. There you go. Hi, Sophia. You ready to get a little wet? Huh? 
You ready to get a little wet? Sophia, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. There you go. You can do it. Good job, Sophia. slide in here to lay my hands on her head. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O God, that through water and the Holy Spirit you give your daughters and sons new birth, that you cleanse us from sin and raise us up to eternal life. Sustain Sophia with the gift of your Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence, now and forever. Amen. Sophia, child of God, you've been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. <laughs> uh huh. That's all right. Sophia, let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Amen. Amen. Please turn your attention to the front for the prayers of the church. Remembering the care and joy, generous works of God, we pray for the church, creation, and the needs of our neighbors and all who labor to keep your creation safe and productive. God of life, your words are the joy at the heart of your church. Draw, draw the seeker to you. Place messages of hope and healing in the mouths of all. Open your children to your truth. We thank you for bringing Sophia today into your church, and we pray that she be a blessing to all she touches during her life. Gracious Lord, hear our prayer. God of steadfast love, renew the earth by your spirit, that lands and oceans reveal the beauty of your creation. Challenge us to live humbly and peacefully as part of your world. Help us not always to strive for more, but help us to be satisfied with all the goodness you have given us. Gracious Lord, hear our prayer. God of patience, lead those who govern to fast to hold fast to what is good. Guide them to show honor to the people of their care. Overcome evil in all nations and grant peace to peoples and places mild, mired in conflict. Gracious Lord, hear our prayer. God of deliverance, remember all who are suffering, lonely, and in pain. Liberate your people being insulted, persecuted, or in the grasp of the ruthless. Give endurance to workers who persevere on this Labor Day and ensure fair wages and safe working environments. Gracious Lord, hear our prayer. God of justice, equip this conversation to, con pardon me, congregation to boldly follow you in uncertain times and to remain faithful in prayer when facing challenges. Gracious Lord, hear our prayer. You comfort those who are hurting, accompany those who are alone, heal those who are sick, provide for all who hunger or thirst, bring joy to the sorrowful, and attend to all who call on you. We trust in your promise of presence and compassion, and so we bring you before you now those in our lives who are on our hearts and minds. And we ask that you hear the prayers we humbly ask for ourselves. Gracious Lord, hear our prayer. 
It is into your hands, O Lord, that we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Do you think she'll let me hold her? Come here, Sophia. How you doing? So, brothers and sisters, I'm so pleased to introduce you to the newest member of the church, <laughs> Sophia. Congratulations. The peace of the Lord be with you all. And also with Let you. Let us share a sign of God's peace. Peace be with you. Yeah. Peace be with you. You can blow that out. Okay. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Who would you like her to go back to? Go back to Daddy. There you go. Thank you. Yeah, sure. And also with you, Jean. Let us pray. God, God of grace, grace and abundance, we joyfully, joyfully offer these gifts of thanks for your blessings in our lives. 
We pray, we pray that, that you find what we bring in this moment to be an acceptable and adequate reflection of, of our gratitude. That you will continue to look on us as your faithful people, worthy of your favor and beneficence. And with humbleness in the face of our hubris, we beg your forgiveness for our lack of attention, respect, and care for all you provide. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give. Thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, you we praise and glorify, you we worship and adore. For you formed the earth from chaos, you encircled the globe with air, you created fire for warmth and light, you nourished the lands with water. It was you who molded us in your image, and with mercy higher than the mountains and with grace deeper than the seas, you blessed your people, the Israelites, and cherished them as your own that we also, who were estranged and dying, might be adopted to live in your spirit, you have called us through the life and death of Jesus, your Son. It was he who, on the night he was handed over, took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to the disciples, saying to them, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for my remembrance. Then after supper he took the cup, And when he had given thanks, he gave it for them to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. It is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for my remembrance. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed hallowed be be thy thy name. Thy kingdom kingdom come, come. thy Thy will will be be done done on earth earth as as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this this day our daily daily bread. And forgive forgive us our our trespasses, trespasses, as we forgive forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, temptation, but but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Just as a reminder, all who seek to answer the invitation of Christ to come and gather with his people at his table are welcome here at our communion rail. As you come forward, as Nadine is doing, please stop and uh, take a glass from one of the trays. The empty glass will be filled with wine from one of the pouring chalices. The glass that already has liquid in it is grape juice, if you prefer that, in the center of each tray.
The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us through this gift in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. 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 Just a couple of quick announcements. This is the end of the summer season at Grace. Not the end of the parable season, but we'll get a couple more of those. But next Sunday, we begin Sunday school. So if you have uh, someone to bring to Sunday school or a friend to bring along to Sunday school, that would be great, 945. Also, it's God's Work, Our Hand Sunday, which means you have an opportunity to lend a hand to helping Grace put together personal care kits and school kits, which go to Lutheran World Relief and are sent around the globe to people who are in need. It's a great project to uh, lend a hand to do. And if you can provide some supplies or some donations to make that happen, please check out the Wednesday and Friday emails that come out every week from Grace. There's lots of information there about how that works. Also, if you're a baker, uh, Leslie Rogler is providing an opportunity for bakers to gather in the Grace Kitchen on Saturday morning to make some wonderful treats for uh, fellowship, which will resume again next Sunday in Fellowship Hall. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Bruce. Sure.